Michael really is a sort of soccer camp for children, yes. African American, Asian American children. So they're actually on the field together. They're Thank working you. towards a goal together. They're struggling together and it creates that bond. Because I know growing up, the strongest bonds I had were with my teammates. So this is a way where they can meet each other and this will create positive emotions towards uh, each other as, as young ones. And then as they grow up, hopefully that will continue. Welcome to The Race to Social Justice, a podcast that explores the myriad racial and social challenges facing the modern world with your hosts, Kiva White and John Kepner. Thank you for being part of the courageous conversation, because when it comes to combating social injustices in America, it is not about being confrontational. It is about being conversational. Good afternoon, John. Hey, Kiva, how you doing? I'm doing well, sir. Good to see you again. Well, welcome everyone to our Race to Social Justice podcast series. As you can see, and as always, I always proclaim, I'm Kiva White. I am the black guy. And I'm John Kepner. I'm the white guy. And Kiva and, and I share the love of the letter K. K for Kiva, K for Kepner, and K for knowledge, what we try to impart in these podcasts, uh, something that Kiva calls the K factor. Yes, sir. And, you know, the goal of these pod podcasts are really to promote racial and social equity and justice through honest and even oftentimes difficult dialogue and what we call courageous conversations. You know, John and I have found over the years that our discussions with each other have deepened our respective understandings of racism in this country, our personal responsibilities that we have to combat that. And that has led us to invite guests to share their honest experiences and learnings. We hope that these conversations will help our listeners as well as our viewers and even our guests in their, along their journeys to um, deal with racial injustice in this country. So thank you all for, for joining us again. So John, who is our guest today? Well, I'm pleased to introduce uh, our guest, Jimmy Chong. Uh, Jimmy and I, it was Kind of interesting how we met. Uh, I'm I'm on a board, um, chair of a governance committee of a board, and I was having breakfast with one of our board members. I try to encourage all board members to to network and ac give access. And you know, all all these nonprofit boards, uh, you know, are interested in having a diverse perspective. And um, I was mentioning this to my fellow board member, who happened to be black guy. Um, mm. And uh, he said, you got to meet Jimmy Chong. I'm going to see him this afternoon. I'm going to tell him about it. it was at some public function. He said, he is really networked into the Asian community. And, um, and I'd like you to meet him. So we had lunch. This was three or four years ago, right, Jimmy? Wow. And, and, uh, and it was one of the most interesting lunches that I've, I've had. He told me um, his story, which I hope he'll tell today. And, and then I introduced him to you, Kiva. And so yes, we've, we've had this and then the pandemic hit. So this is our first time yeah. back together. And why do we pick April Fool's Day? Uh, we're not going to go. There. <laughs> Today, we're recording this on April, April 1st. But um, yeah. uh, that's that's the background. Jimmy is a uh, really busy guy. Uh, mm. He is an attorney. He's going to tell you about his practice and that sort of thing. But he's really uh, networked into his community. And it's yeah. a really interesting community. So, uh, so welcome, Jimmy, Jimmy. John. Yes, thank you for joining us. Well, thank so, you, gentlemen, for having me. Well, good. So, so let's dive right in, um, Jimmy. Um, I mentioned, you know, our discussion, and you told me the story of your your parents, your family, and how you grew up, and what it was like. Uh, so, let me just just uh, let's just start there. Okay, great. As a youngster. Hey. Well, before we jump into that, I just want to thank you guys for clarifying, um, you know, who was the black guy and who was the white guy in this group, because I was a little confused. So <laughs> it was hard. It was hard to tell. It was hard to make that distinguishing. Oh, right. <laughs> but um, I and so, John, I'm, I'm not going to lie. We are meeting was so long ago. I can't quite recall the stories or the story I told you when we met um, about my childhood. It's uh, really it's really not a exciting childhood. It's very, actually a very common childhood for Korean Americans. Um, you know, my, my, I was born and raised in Wilmington, Delaware. Um, and my parents had immigrated over here from South Korea. 
my uh, father came in 1972 first and made some money and was able to send back for my mother to come over here. And uh, they were actually on the West Coast first and eventually made it over to um, to Delaware, uh, you know, through, uh, I would say, probably about five years. Um, and uh, I am the youngest of three boys. And uh, yeah, so it's we um, when I say we, it's a very typical Korean American uh, story is because my parents are, are not educated. Um, they moved here and were could not speak English. And they came here with really no money. Um, as I told you, my father came first before he could afford to fly my mother over here. So because of the reasons with the language um, hurdles, with no education, there's really not much work that my parents could find in America. Uh, mm -hmm. In saying that, though, the opportunities here were far greater than they were for my parents in Korea. Uh, but so they eventually opened their own store and it was a dry cleaners. And, uh, you know, so there's so many Korean American uh, guys out there, girls out there in my generation that know, um, you know, that's kind of was the, the Korean niche niche in America. And, you know, they would work, you know, open six days of work, days a week, work seven days a week. Mm. Um, you know, we never, you know, never went on vacation. I literally growing up never went on vacation because they owned the store. They operated it. There's, you know, if they weren't there, no one was there. Um, and but it was a great childhood. I'm, I'm not going to lie. Um, you know, I was given opportunities that my parents never had. Um, you know, they grew up in a war torn country and I grew up in America, which is the greatest country in the world. So I have absolutely no complaints. Mm. Wow. So th thank you for sharing that. You know, this, there's a couple of common themes that we've been finding in doing these podcasts. And, you know, we always like to go into the childhood. And one of the things that we're finding is that many of our guests um, success in all different arenas. And we're going to talk about, about your career in a second. But one of the common themes is that they all started from humble beginnings. And so I so appreciate you sharing that, uh, you know, about your upbringing, and your, you know, your parental, uh, you know, your parents background coming here uh, with those humble beginnings. And, and here you are. Uh, a successful attorney. And so I wanted to talk a little bit, ask you a little bit about that. Like what led you into law? What type, what kind of law do you practice? And just tell us about your journey along that, that process, because I think, um, you know, starting from humble beginnings with your, with your parents coming to where you are now, um, is, is just, uh, uh, I want to hear more about that. Sure. And it's um, really, um, it's all as a result of, of my parents. I had very little to do with where I am right now. Mm. Um, the, you know, the discipline, the work ethic was all from, from my parents. The opportunities were created by my parents for, for me and my brothers. You know, my oldest brother is a, you know, a chiropractor. My middle brother is a teacher with, uh, you know, like four different degrees, two masters, two bachelors, and actually I think a minor, um, you know, and they gave us those opportunities. Um, but growing up, uh, we, my parents faced obviously a, a lot of challenges. Um, you know, there's basic things like going to, a, to the doctor's office or going to contest a, a parking ticket uh, or very, or were challenges for my parents because of the language issue and because of, of their accent. And uh, what, one story that I really remember very clearly is when I was in high school, my father had called uh, the cable company and disputed the bill for one reason or another. I can't remember exactly why, but I do remember listening to everything my father said, and he said everything correctly, but he had a thick accent. And um, basically, I could hear the individual on the other end not understanding or uh, 
not wanting maybe to understand what my father was saying. And as the conversation went on, the other end individual would just start speaking louder and louder to where it seemed like if he thought he would yell, then my father would understand his point of view. Um, and I remember that because I remember everything my father said. And when my father hung up the phone, I called back and mm. purposely stated everything that my father had stated. But I stated it in perfect English and not but a couple of minutes, the issue was resolved and it was, you know, it was, we moved on. But that yeah. is one of the things that really stuck out to me is that even if people who come here to speak with, you know, with an accent, even if they say the same things that I would say, it's not, for some reason, it does not accomplish the same, it, we don't get to the same point, not to, to the same end, end game. Right. So, <clears throat> so I, I say that because I know that growing up, my parents always told my, my brothers and myself that we should find a career or a, a job that helped others mm -hmm. and really helped people like my parents, immigrants, help them when they're in certain situations like like my, my father was dealing with this cable bill, but obviously on a, a bigger scale. Sure. And I think that's what led me to be a lawyer, my brother to be a teacher, and my other brother to be a chiropractor, all service wow. industries to help. Um, but, but in saying that, I, I didn't know I wanted to be a lawyer, um, really for the majority, uh, until I actually took the, the LSATs. I, um, I went to school, I had a business and econ double major. I had um, worked at a bank for a year. I, I did not like it. And I, I'd never been to Korea in my life at that point in time. And I thought I should go there before I, I lose the opportunity. I'm still young, I have nothing to tie me down. So I right. actually went out there for a year and I taught. Wow. Yeah, I taught English in Korea and Japan, and I watched the 2002 World Cup over there. I'm a huge soccer fan. It was the nice. best time in my life. But when I, when I came back, I didn't have a job, and my room, I was living uh, with a couple friends, and my roommate's best friend's mom was a managing attorney at a law firm. And mm. she needed someone to come in and um, do, you know, shred paper, make coffee, do runs, pick up experts at the house, uh, you know, at the uh, airport, really every, like the bottom level of a, a law firm. And mm. it was, it was great. I worked there. Then I was, uh, then I took the LSATs. I stayed on there as a law clerk. And after I graduated law school, I actually became an attorney there. So I went from every level, from the lowest position all the way to an attorney in that law firm. So that's, wow. that was my journey to becoming a lawyer. Wow. Wait, so, so, those, so those humble beginnings that your parents seemed like this, that, that spirit of humility fell upon you. And I can honestly say when I first spoke to you, this was years back, I sensed that. I sensed that you, was a, you were a genuine, authentic humble individual that wanted to see um, good for all people, uh, regardless of their social identity. So I, I really, I really thank you so much for sharing that story. Uh, Cause it really, um, it really accents, you know, that, 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 um, that humility piece um, that I, that is, is, is resonated in your story with your parents. Thank you for sharing that. So when I was a young lawyer, just starting out in mm. my Philadelphia law firm, our uh, librarian was from South Korea, first generation mm. woman. And she fell in love with a um, PhD physics uh, candidate at Penn uh, who was Japanese. And their common language was English. So, so when you were talking about language, that was one thought I had. Um, and, and it was interesting because 
I was told at the time the Japanese and the Koreans were not necessarily culturally a good fit, but they made it work. They that's made it work. And it became, we became friends and that sort of thing. But, but the other thing, when you were talking about the language, difficult that example you gave with your dad, made me think mm -hmm. of, let me ask you guys, and I'll tell you my, um, when, when you go on the phone now, if you have some technology, whether it's Comcast or whatever, and oh, you go yeah, on the no, phone, you, mm -hmm. uh, you, you encounter someone with a different accent. Mm -hmm. And it is it is sometimes very, very hard. And I, I, I can feel myself getting angry, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and I have this, uh, you know, I, I I want this person to speak like I can understand. It. I'm the customer, you know, mm -hmm. but it is, but it is a it is a um, and I have to check myself from getting angry. So when you guys, what reaction do you have when you go on? to that sort of service and you can't understand everything the person's saying. Yeah, it's frustrating. And it really depends, I guess it depends on the nature of the situation that I'm trying to resolve and the sense of urgency. Um, if it's something, you know, you know, if it has to do anything with banking, um, it seems like we, we are, we're, the customer service is not outsourced, so that's great. But for like things like, um, if you're trying to buy something, you know, return something from like a Target or mm -hmm. any of these large corporations that outsource their customer service, it goes to all these different countries and it can be frustrating. So what I try to do is just try to, as a DEI consultant, I recognize that linguistic competence is something that I try to practice myself and try to speak language that everybody, but it's, it's like, like Jimmy was saying, it's the accent that really is challenging me when I can't understand what the person is saying and, and vice versa. They, they can't. So for me, it's the, it's, the, it's the accent that I can't understand what they're saying. And then on their side, it's the comprehension that can create a barrier. So I just try to be patient. Um, sometimes, it, like I said, it depends on what it is. I, you could be on the phone for 30, 40 minutes trying to resolve a, a simple issue. Yeah. Jimmy, what about you? So I, I, you know, it, it's interesting that you, you bring that up. I, I look at it actually in a little different way. Um, I don't look at it as, um, you know, uh, someone speaking English with an accent. I actually look at it as why are, and this may be going in a whole different realm, Let's but what, why, why are our companies outsourcing to a different country and I, I mean, I understand economics and, and so forth, but we need to, we as a country need to start saying, hey, we need to figure out a way how to keep jobs in America, how mm. to, uh, you know, pay Americans because these large corporations, they're making money off of, of all of us Americans. And then they're paying pennies on the dollars, outsourcing to a different country and one the money in america is going to a different country and then although it's minimal and two is the wealth is being kept in you know this one small group while the middle class and the, the low class in america are not you know the, the opportunities aren't there for them so that's the concern i get when i mm. when i see that and i hear that yeah. that's where i get upset more than the yeah I think of that too. I, That's I, good. Um, good. I, 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 I go through the all sorts of <laughs> things. I try to say, well, you know, this person's just trying to do their job, right? You know, I'm sure they know everything they need to know. It's really just a communication issue. So, I will try to politely ask them to repeat what they're saying so I can understand it. I sometimes blame myself because my hearing is going. You know, and I'm not hearing well. You know, and that sort of thing. A, a, an array of emotions, but, um, yeah. but then I think, you know, are you being, you know, a white privileged guy who, you know, is really, you know, not really treating somebody really well. And yeah. um, so it's, but, but, it, 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 I asked it because everybody has this issue. Everybody encounters yeah. it and, and we all deal with it differently, I guess. But, you know? but what you are there is you are a customer to That's an right. American company yeah, I'd say that, yeah. Yeah. that is outsourcing to, Yep. Not Americans to yeah. 
not, not a very good, and that's a, a whole different issue. So yeah, yeah. Um, I wouldn't feel bad about it if I were you. <laughs> it's well, a good so, point. So, it's a good point you raised, though, Jimmy. It's a really good point that you raise about the the keeping the economic viability of the of of this nation in this nation. And you know, you as consumer, I, I know me as a consumer. If I go to a restaurant, I look for a couple of things. The first thing is is quality customer service by the staff, the atmosphere, and the food has to taste good. But number one is customer service. If if the food is good and the atmosphere is the best atmosphere, but the customer service is lousy, I will not go back. And so that's how I feel when I'm making these calls and I'm getting it. I I, want to just not buy from this company again because of that experience. Yeah. well, so Jimmy, one thing that impressed me when we first met is that you you seem to have a real commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and it seemed very genuine to me. And why is that? Um, I mean, I guess well, one the the easy answer is because uh, I'm, I'm Asian, so I'm a, a, a minority. And growing up in Delaware, uh, it was mm. a, a huge minority. Um, there were a lot of, you know. African Americans, a lot of you know white Americans, uh, a lot of Hispanic Americans, but very very few Asian Americans where where I grew up. Um, and so I went to a pretty large public school, uh, an elementary school, and there were no there really were no age. I didn't. It was me, my my brother, and there was a rumor of a Japanese girl that I never saw the whole time I was there. And, um, you know, daily, I'm, I'm called a chink, uh, you know, uh, Jimmy Chin Chong, you know, Jimmy Chin Chong, and I don't care what's saying to me every day. Um, it's mm-hmm. a Jimmy Crackhorn. Um, mm-hmm. And it was, you know, to a point where I was getting in fights, definitely weekly, almost daily. And I would go home and I would be, you know, beat up because I would, I would get in, in fourth grade, you know, I getting fights it would be you know not just one person it would be me against a couple of kids and it it got to a point where my parents were very concerned and they actually had to um you know to pull me out of school and i um you know stopped going just because it was just i got in fights every day and the thing i remember then is if someone called me a chink Someone said, you know, you know, you don't belong in this country or Chinese, Japanese, dirty knees. It was OK. I, I, I was told by teachers, superiors say, you know, they're jo- they're only joking. Don't be too sensitive. You know, mm. just learn to laugh at yourself. However, if I had said anything, you know, a, a racial comment in the other direction, I got in trouble. Mm. And that bothered me because it was just, it was okay to call nation a chink back then. And it it was Mm. nothing. But if I said something else to a Hispanic, to an African-American, it was, I got, I got in trouble. Uh, So we, Mm. I just felt like we were treated, we Asian Americans were treated differently, um, at least at the school I went to. Mm. So as an adult professional lawyer, mm-hmm. do you experience similar things? I mean, you're not getting into fights, right? But do you, do you, do you, is it more subtle? Is it still there? Um, so very early on in my career, uh, it was, you know, a different time um, than it is now where I, I got a lot of like, wow, you speak really good English. Mm-hmm. Um and you know where are you from? Uh, I'm from Delaware. Now, where were you? Where were you born? Oh, Wilmington. Now, where are you really from? And it's not. I'm not from America in the eyes of Americans. Um, and that you know that's still people will still have those comments. Or you know where where are you really from? Um, you know I have you know some that as an adult you know there have been been fights because, um, you know, it's, you know, get called a chink, you know, while you're out with friends and, 
you know, have a couple of drinks, sometimes emotions kind of go. And that's the first thing that anyone says, um, you know, if they're upset with me, uh, they want to, um, you know, make me upset. You know, I get a lot of squinty eyes. Uh, it still happens, you know, at hmm. this, this age, uh, you know, when I grew up playing soccer my whole life and you get very competitive, I don't think there are very few times where I was not called, uh, you know, a name during a, during a game. Um, mm. You know, it's, you know, it, it happens so much. You just kind of, you just get used to it. Jimmy, is um, it, is it always come from white people or does no. it come from other races too? Uh, all other races. Mm -hmm. it, it comes from everyone. It's, it's not, uh, oh, it's in, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, you know, I hear a lot of, a lot of microaggressions in your in your testimony there like you you you're enduring uh you know these microaggressions these and someone you know just hearing you say that someone said it's not a big deal and so we teach about microaggressions and the big myth about just the term itself micro means that you know it can insinuate exactly what you just said jimmy that it's not a big deal but it is a big deal it's a small, subtle uh, uh, slight that creates um, massive emotional and psychological and some, and that oftentimes physical harm to people. And just hearing you share your story as a young person, here you are an adult, I can still hear and see, you know, a little bit of, you know, the traumatic, the potential traumatic impact that could have had on you by experiencing all that on a constant basis. And I just, you know... Ah, man, it's just we got we got so far to go in our society around to deal with these things. And I appreciate your courage of sharing that and, and your level of commitment. I can tell, you know, from our all, anytime we have personal experiences with these things, we're committed to, you know, getting this. And that's why we call it the race. It is the race we're pushing towards this finish line to try to create some type of uh, so, a society where there's equality, equity for all people, regardless of their social identities. And so I wanted to check in with you on how have you translated your commitment to your work with uh, DEI into action, either either on the personal level or professional in your professional life to, to assure that other people don't may not have to experience or endure what you have experienced around these issues? Uh, yeah, so I, um, I, what I try to do is I, I try to get involved um, you know, at the grassroots level, I, I try to, um, I don't, I don't want to say educate, but I try to um, let other people know of different experiences. I need to learn of other experiences. Uh, but the, the, one of the biggest things I, I like to do is um, work with younger, you know, the youth, you know, it could be anywhere from, uh, you know, children in elementary school or up to uh, college students, uh, um, law students, young professionals. Uh, I've been involved uh, with the Montgomery Bar Association's DEI committee as uh, a chair or a vice chair, um, I know, maybe four years. This is the first year where I'm not involved uh, at that high level. It just, it, it really is a lot emotionally draining. Um, mm. I am part of Congresswoman Dean's Racial Advisory Committee, uh, and I am on, uh, you know, maybe four nonprofit boards where it there's a component of DEI that um, it is what drew me to it. Uh, I'm also uh, involved in the uh, National Asian Bar Association. So I can meet Asians across the Asian attorneys across the country. And, uh, you know, we do different events to bring awareness about issues in the API community. Uh, in January, uh, we had a, an event where many politicians, you know, came out and supported the API community. Um, you know, there's just a lot of little things here and there that I like to, to be involved with. But my one big goal right now that I want to do is I want to right now in Philadelphia and in other parts of the country. But in Philadelphia, there is a um, 
there's some tension between African American community and the Asian American community. Uh, and there, it's for a million different reasons. And I, that, that tension's mm-hmm. been there well before I was around. Um, and I believe that what we need to do is we need to come together and we need to meet each other. We need to, to know each other. We need to, um, you know, experience each other. So I want to start a, like a, my goal really is to start a soccer camp for children yes. and, and African-American, Asian-American children. So they're actually on the field together. They're Same working team. towards a goal together. They're struggling together and it creates that bind. Cause I know growing up the strongest binds I had were with my teammates. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I also, you know, want to, so this is a way where they can meet each other and this will create positive um, emotions towards uh, each other as, as young ones. And then as they grow up, hopefully that will continue. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's really what I would, I am kind of, my sights are right now in, in trying to get that going. Uh, but they're, awesome. you know, they're just some of the small things that uh, I, I've been trying to do. So, yeah. Wow. That's a, long that's a good strategy. Things. Yeah, yeah. But that's yeah. a good strategy to team building. Yeah, I like that. But Jimmy, uh, the uh, tying right into that a bit is is um, a lot of press coverage now of hate crimes, violence against uh, AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islanders. Um, why is this happening now? It didn't just start now. What what what's going on, and what are your thoughts on that whole issue? Um, it's it's not new. It's just new uh, in mainstream America. Mainstream America is noticing it, paying attention to it, and it's being um, covered in the news media for the first time ever. There's always been, I believe, um, the the quote unquote AAPI hate in existence. Um, You know, you go back and you look at the history of Asian Americans in this country. And, uh, you know, I should have prepared myself. uh, So if I get some of these dates wrong, I apologize. But, uh, you know, the reason initially Asians came to this country really was because the Chinese came in to help build the railroads uh, to go out west. Uh, But they were treated as second class citizens where they did not have the same rights as non-Asians in this country. And it actually was to a point where there was a law where Asian Americans were not allowed in this country. Now it was really focused, you know, on Chinese Americans. However, you know, if you're Korean, Japanese, Chinese, it, you know, everyone thought you were Chinese. And uh, there was a quota, you know, no Asian Americans were allowed into this country. Then there was a quarter where they opened it up to, I think, like a hundred, um, you know, Chinese Americans that were allowed in America. It's the only law that specifically stated a race could not, or you know, or um, you know, nationality could not come into America. And if you look at, you know, go through the the history, then you, you know, World War, um, you know, war, what is it, World War Two, and the Japanese you know, internment Mm -hmm. camps, you know, basically prison um, and, you know, our own American citizens who had lived here for generations that never were ever lived in Japan were essentially thrown into prison and to jail for being Asian. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's kind of the attitude that the mainstream mainstream Americans have. You know, I still think they continue to have towards Asians. Now, in um, in the 80s, uh, there was, um, and I really should have done done my uh, my homework. Um, there's an individual, um, last name is Chin. He's Chinese American in Detroit, and he was going out for his bachelor uh, bachelor party out in Detroit. And this is at the time when Japanese cars were coming into this country and the American, uh, you know, car industry was on the decline. People were losing their jobs. People were being laid off. 
And while he was at a bar, as a Chinese American, uh, two, two guys said, hey, you know, I lost my job. He's, uh, he's laid off because people like you. And hmm. they confused Chinese and, and, and Japanese Americans. And they got in a fight. You know, it kind of, it ended. And when the Chinese American guy left the bar, these guys followed him with a bat and beat him to death. Hmm. And th- this was his, on his bachelor, in you know, a bachelor party. The two guys who beat him to death got no jail time only probation. And that was a clear signal to Asian Americans that we were definitely not considered um, on the same level as other Americans. And this wasn't that long ago. Um, And, you know, if someone had beaten a dog to death, would have gotten more time, a higher punishment Mm -hmm. than these two guys. So that is uh, really, I believe, um, some of the, the issues or some of the just attitudes towards Asian Americans in this country. Um, I mean, it's not everyone. Don't get me wrong. It's not all the time. And, and actually, uh, Kiva, it's a, I had a discussion with a, um, a Jewish American about this last night where yeah. there is... Um, you know, race is such a, a, a tough thing. And then, you know, any racism, no matter what level is, is terrible. But what I stated to, to my friend, I said, listen, you know, the African-American, the, the, you know, African-Americans, the history in America is just so much worse than anything that um, I think that any other race religion anything had to have endured and mm. and she said look there's you can't nothing's worse than the other it's all bad and i i disagreed with her because mm. this is you know went from slavery to um you know to basically uh i guess right now to system, systemic racism and you're talking just generation after generation after generation after generation and, um, you know, I just think it's, it's different in that I'll say, you know, some of the things I'm saying are, are to Asian Americans, it's, it's not right, but I just, I really cannot say I have experienced anything to what an African American has um, experienced in this country. Yeah. And what, as an African American, what do you feel or how do you feel when you hear about racism you know, against Asian Americans or, um, you know, Hispanic yeah. Americans compared to African Americans. What, what's your thought on that? Yeah, I, I agree with your, uh, the person that you were talking about, the Jewish American person, that racism is not good for anybody. Uh, I just think the history of racism in this country, in America, yes, African Americans have endured more uh, hardship, you know, 400 years of slavery. That's a long time. Um, however, the laws, the immigration laws, the naturalization acts, citizenship laws that was passed way back in you know, the 1700s, they were just meant to marginalize all people except someone, anybody that was not of whiter skin. So I think even from back then, the system that was put in place was to marginalize all of us. Um, that was not of, of, the, of the dominant culture at the time, which was that of the, um, you know, a, a white person. And even, even the laws uh, was stated that only certain uh, privileges could be afforded to those who were, quote unquote, white, uh, on white people. The Naturalization Act, I believe it was uh, 1919, I mean, 1652, really kind of kind of separated um the races, you know, the Native Americans, the African American, the mulattoes, all of those things to just uh, allow for um, the advantages and the privileges of society to be afforded to only one class or population or of, of, of individuals. So I think racism uh, is a construct. It's a, what I call it's a man-made ideal made to appear real, right? And so race is just race. You know, we all have different race. You're, uh, you know, Korean, I'm African-American, John's white. 
However, the moment you put the ism behind race, ism, the ISM, individual, institutional, or systemic, structural marginalization, that's when you get problems in this country. Because, you know, without, without, assign, you know, without attaching the, the, the ism to any of our social identities, it's just, diff- we're just different. We're just diverse, a diverse uh, nation. But the moment you add the ism, and that's what some of those laws were, they were they were strategically put in place to marginalize people. And there was a reason for that. Because if you were non-white and all the, all the laws applied to someone who was white, that means if you were white, you had uh, access to the land, you had access to, to vote, you had access to licenses, you had access to, uh, you know, to own a home, and everybody else didn't. And so it wasn't until 1952 and I'll check my math, that these laws were turned around, that that race was not used as a quota uh, qualifier for citizenship. It was overturned. And so think about that. For 162 years, only non anybody that was not white, we were not afforded those privileges. So, of course, you have, you, you have economic social status advantages. Uh, but to answer your original question, I think, in general, African-Americans have endured more uh, because the race component is really based on skin. And so, like, for me, I'm really, really dark. I'm real. I'm like, I'm black African-American. Um, and so I, you know, I've, I've, I've went through, you know, discrimination, racial profiling, living in New York, going to school all the way upstate. So I just think um, slavery and, and that whole institution and how it's been um, socialized into the fabric of American culture is why, um, you know, I agree with you that the intensity of racism that the African Americans endured is more. Uh, it's a great word, it's, intensity. That yeah, it's no great yeah, descriptor. It's, yeah, yeah. I just think we all experience. You, you know, you experience it, but it's not. It may not be at the level. But I agree, racism is racism. It doesn't matter which level. John, um, with, the the reason I asked you about. Why is it becoming more evident is because I have a perspective of that um, yeah. wasn't previously the case the last several years is that um, we're, we're hearing more about all s- different types of racism. Mm-hmm. The, the, the uh, violence against Asian American Pacific Islanders was not something I ever really thought about until recently, to be frank with you. And it's because my awareness has been built by what's in the news. Mm-hmm. Um, my awareness has been built because now there are um, movies produced by Asian Americans that, with Asian American actors that 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 I go see. You know, so there are all sorts of different things happening in our society that are are raising awareness, and I think that's a that's a step in the right direction. Um, but the other thing I think about is, you know, the long course of history, maybe it's because I'm older than you guys, but, um, uh, you know, our, our nation is going to be, uh, minor- what, being white is going to be a minority in our nation sooner than uh, most people realize the projections are that way. The, it'll probably happen sooner. And I think um, there are more families with more different colors in them than i seen, uh, you know, including my own family and including Mm -hmm. our best friends' families. Um, And and so uh, familiarity, uh, family integration, you know, is is going to to help. It's still going to take, I'm not demeaning the problem at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Because because this is, you know, uh, you know, not necessarily what I'm saying happening across the entire country. But I bet it makes gives me some hope. Is what I'm saying. Those those, yeah. those issues um, along these lines. Um, so I, I know we're we're uh, a little short on time. Um, another term, you know, language is so important here. Another term, mm-hmm. um, model minority, that's often used to characterize uh, uh, the, these uh, Asian American community. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Um, beginning to hear that more and more is what kind of label is that? Is that a good label, a bad label? What does a label mean to you? Mm. So the the yeah, it's a great question. So a- Asians are, you know, we have been labeled as the model minority, and that you know, essentially saying that 
it gives everyone thinks Asians are all very intelligent, all very um, successful and have, you know, have, um, I guess, well, to a certain extent. And, um, you know, they don't, you know, us Asians, we don't go through any really, there's no tough times. Um, I yeah. guess that is uh, sometimes what people feel. Um, you know, I know that, you know, I've been told, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're Asian, you're smart, or, uh, you know, that's kind of what was a given. And, um, you know, that's a good thing. Why, why is that so upsetting? And it's, you know, one is, you know, you never want to be boxed and labeled, you know, so they're, they're saying we're smart, uh, but we're not athletic. Uh, we don't know how to lead people. We are, are timid and we're not able to stand up for ourselves. So, um, you know, that's kind of goes into that model minority. And also the fact of the matter is there is a huge population of Asian Americans that are, live under the poverty li uh, line. Mm -hmm. You know, they are not, um, they don't do well in school. They're not going to Ivy Leagues uh, and they are disregarded and uh, they're not a small percentage. It's, a, it's actually a fairly large percentage. So the, um, you know, that narrow view or uh, naive view that, you know, we are model minorities is works negatively uh, in that manner. But I think the biggest thing is, and this is a theory that there, you know, when Asians came to this country, the people in power said, look at those Asians, they're quiet, they put their head down, they work, they're model minorities. You African-Americans, why can't you be more mm -hmm. like Asian-Americans? Mm -hmm. And that created so much tension and hate between the two communities mm -hmm. when it was not, it was not, it shouldn't have been there, but it was yeah. created by the people in power, the people of majority. Wow, oh, that's really yeah. interesting. That's a really, yeah, yeah that's a, a really good point. That's another, again, that's another example of a social construct that leads to destruction. So mm -hmm. race was a con social construct that just led to all kinds of destruction in our society. And I, I, I don't like the word minority. I just was having a conversation with the, the, this, about this very, the word minority uh, with a colleague early this morning. And I agree with you, Jimmy, that the model minority is another socially constructed term that leads to divisiveness. Because if, if Latinos, African-Americans, any minority group that's not a part of my, my, the majority is now, there's another layer of marginalization even in, in the term minority. And that creates an, an additional layer of divisiveness. Because now that's what I was thinking when I was growing up and hearing, you know, hearing that like the Asians are smart in math and accounting and all these things. And I'm like, wow, I got, well, I got, I got some competition here. It just created this, this, um, you know, this veil of competition. Yes, exactly. And I just think we have to continue to uh, educate ourselves. We have to continue to um, expose ourselves to different cultures and be around. So I like your idea about this soccer team and about putting the Asian uh, uh, kids and, and on the same team with African-American team uh, um, 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 children, because that's gonna help them to get to know each other, you know, in the context of their difference, as well as in the context of their similarities, right? But this model minority, this term right here is another social construct or narrative that I believe is, is, is here to create exactly which is a divisive tool. And I just don't like the word minority anyway, because I'm a major player. I try to tell people I'm a major player in this society. I'm trying to make major moves and major changes. I'm not a minority. I don't embrace that term at all. So I really appreciate um, your perspective on this term model minority, because what's the, what's the model? What is the model? What is that? What are we, what am I supposed to be modeling myself at, at, if I'm a yeah. minority yeah. of a society, right. I don't want to model myself yeah. to be a minority. A good, good, good discussion. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, well, we're 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 running uh, down on time, and um, yeah, this is good. Uh, I I was going to ask you. I'm going to spare you. 
uh, <laughs> a question about the Supreme Court case involving Harvard and UNC, uh, because I want to see whether UNC wins the uh, the tournament. Uh, for, no, no, no. I we were out of time, but but that well, that'll give us an excuse to invite you back, Jimmy, and you can tell us all about that case after it's decided. All right, so. <laughs> So, I would love um, to, and I would love to, to yeah. give you my thoughts on that. And actually, I know we're running out of time, but John, I, I wanted to ask some of your points of view, because over the past few years, there's really been a astrization of called, called white males, Caucasian males in this country. And, um, you know, it's, I believe that it's now becoming, it's not a good thing because when, we continue to say you guys are all bad um it's just going to create more decisiveness more hate and the the you know it's mm. for some people it's tough being a white male during this time period with you know the me too movement and with everything going together so at your point of view you're hearing this and you know what what do yeah. what, what's going through your mind well, thanks for the question. Um, uh, the other day, uh, I, I'm on three governance boards, and the chair of one of the governance boards. Uh, and, and today, today I uh, brought forward uh, an introductory meeting with a, uh, a a lawyer, a white lawyer at a firm downtown, who I knew, you know, who I thought would be a really great candidate. And when I was having dialogue with our governance chair. Uh, by email, um, he said, "Well, it sounds like a great candidate, but wouldn't wouldn't do doesn't qualify on the diversity candidate." And mm -hmm. I I responded to him. I said, "We're not at a point. I hope we're not at a point where we're going to disqualify a really great candidate because he happens to be white." Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and I see that I'm seeing this over and over and yep. over again. Um, as someone was talking to me about, um, also about uh, uh, all of the, um, uh, in a certain class, of, uh, we're all just hiring black women. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I, I think we're going to come into a balance. I mean, I think, it, and I think for uh, I, I, I'm, I'm beginning to to see dialogue about. Um, uh, white people learning to turn over that power control mm -hmm. to other to people that look differently because they have the talents, the intellect, they have all the things to do to manage things and may have actually a better perspective because of their life experience. So, so I, I see some shifting that way. I mean, I'm maybe I'm pie in the sky and, and um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of older white, people, men and women, on boards that are saying, you could say it's an excuse because you want to get off the board, but it's it's my time is yeah. is now uh, yeah. to, to let go. Uh, yesterday I was on the, and I'll finish with this, yesterday I was on the board of, uh, on, on a, a call with a, a large uh, philanthropy network, uh, sorry, annual meeting, and one of the participants in a breakout group, uh, a, a woman who, you know, is, is basically heads up a major uh, a foundation said, I, I'm stepping down. And this was the reason she's stepping down. And, and, and so, so I'm seeing some shifting that way, but, but there are other parts of society where I'm seeing, you know, white men are angry, you know, they're, yeah. they're scared, they're, scared. Yeah. they're being displaced. And, yeah. you know, so I'm not necessarily, my experience is not necessarily the right, it, it, the only experience. Well, I'm, you know, I'm glad, I'm glad you talked about uh, John, the piece about, the the um, effort for organizations to over diversify and you know in my work as a dei consultant i always warn people i say be very careful with that because over diversification can lead to acts of discrimination and you have to be very careful if you're trying to you're trying to right side and bring in you know it's got to be a balance and it's got to be you know checks and balances around these things it just can't be we need to diversify because we got an all white, you know, you know, B suite um, staff, so you have to be very careful about. Yeah, that. I, I look at it as uh, does you know 
does the person fill all the usual requirements that you want on a board member or as a CEO or whatever? Uh, but do, is is there is their life experience as a as a person of color bring? Is that an asset? Yeah. To the organization. And in many cases, it really is an asset. And then the white people got to get over the this that there aren't enough candidates for these positions. Yeah, that's yeah, qualify. Well, not not totally, candidates. Totally, yeah, not true. candidates. You got to add. You got to add the word. There's not enough qualified candidates. Right. Well, then because, that's a that's a yeah bad word. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> implicit in that is oh, there yeah yeah there aren't the pool isn't of qualified candidates. That's, Correct. That's Correct. racist. That's a racist. Yeah. 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 Well, Jimmy, thanks. Thanks so much. This was awesome. Guys. But I can't believe how quickly this hour went by. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Well, thank you yeah, so much, thanks. Jimmy, for, for, for lending your perspective and your transparency. And, and again, your commitment to, um, you know, make the world a better place. I could I could hear it. That's, that's why I love. That's why me and John connect because we have we may be of different, you know, cultural and racial backgrounds, but we just all share the same compassion around these issues which led us to do these podcasts and and everyone has just been, I know for me has really been a blessing for me and my journey uh, towards social justice. So I appreciate you joining us today. And I hope, I hope those of you who are listening out here get to see this because if you could see this guy's smile, that makes (laughs) you, you have this great smile. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you everybody. Thank you all so much. Uh, Jimmy, you want to say anything before we close out? I just say thank you. It's been an honor, uh, truly an honor to be on here. And I want to thank you two gentlemen for what you are doing and how you're really furthering the discussion and really furthering moving into a positive direction. So thank you. Um, what you're doing is it, it's it's great. And uh, you've been, I know you guys have been in this space for years and years and years now. Um, and it's really uh, amazing to see what you, you guys are doing and having this oh, podcast so thank you awesome thank all you. right okay thank you thank very you. much awesome so with that thank you all out there for listening for all our viewers uh on our youtube channel we we really appreciate it uh make sure that you subscribe if you haven't done so already and and join us the next time for as we continue this race to social justice because we're running for the race and i truly believe that one day we'll get to the finish line thank you so much for joining us The Race to Social Justice podcast is produced, edited, and mixed at The Dream in Austin, Texas. Visit thedreamrecordingstudio.com for more info.